if you're hungry, it's not a deterministic drive. It's a subpersonality that has a goal, and then it has a bunch of action patterns that are going to work in reference to that goal. It has a bunch of perceptions that, that suit that goal, and it organizes your emotional responses around that goal. And so to think about it as a personality is a much, it's a much more intelligent way to look at it. One other thing about Skinner's rats, you know, Skinner could get rats to do almost everything and he would reward them with food. And so he had a simple rat model, but his rats were starved down to 75% of their normal body weight. So not only were they not social, gregarious rats, like rats are, because they were isolated, they were genetically um, altered from wild rats, but they also weren't as complex as a real rat because they were starving. And so, but you know, a starving rat is a pretty good model of a rat, and a rat is a pretty good model of a person. But our, a lot of our models of simple behavioral learning were based on starving, isolated rats. So, anyways, how to think about motivation? We'll think about it from the hypothalamic perspective. So, we could say one thing that motivation does is set goals. And we could say that emotions track progress towards goals. And I'm going to use that schema, even though it's not exactly right. So, you say, well, Motivation determines where you're going to aim, so if you're hungry, you're going to aim at something to eat. And then, that will organize your perceptions, so that you zero out everything that isn't relevant to that task, which is almost everything. You concentrate on those few things that are going to facilitate your movement forward. When you encounter those things, that produces positive emotion. As you move through the world towards your goal, and you see that things are laying themselves out that facilitate your movement forward, those things cause positive emotion. And if you encounter anything that gets in the way, then that produces negative emotion. And it can be like threat, because you're not supposed to encounter something that gets in the way. It can be anger, so that you move it away. It can be frustration, disappointment, grief. Those would, if, if you had a response that serious to an obstacle, it would probably punish the little motivated frame right out of existence. You know, so you walk downstairs and, I don't know, the contracting company has set a wrecking ball through your kitchen. It's like, that's going to be disappointing. You're not going to keep eating the peanut butter sandwich in the rubble. That little frame is going to get punished out of existence, and some new goal is going to pop up in its stead. And, you know, one of the things we're going to try to sort out is how do you decide when you've encountered an obstacle that's so big that you should just quit and go do something else? Because that's not obvious. You know, and you can, you can get into counterproductive persistence pretty easily. So we, we don't know how people solve that problem. It's a really complicated one. So anyways, we're going to work on that scenario. Your hypothalamus pops up micro goals that are directly relevant to biological survival. That produces a frame of reference. So it's not a goal, it's not a drive, and it's not a collection of behaviors. It's a little personality. And the personality has a viewpoint, it has thoughts that go along with it, it has perceptions, it has action tendencies, all of that. You can see this in addiction, most particularly. So, one of the things that you find often with people who are alcoholic is they lie all the time. And that's because when they're, they've built a little alcohol dependent personality inside of themselves, or a big one, it might, maybe it's 90% of their personality. And one of, that, one of the things that consists of is all the rationalizations that they've used over the years to justify their addiction to themselves and to other people. And so the addiction has a personality. You know, and so when the person is off, or maybe they're addicted to meth or something like that, where you know the addiction is more, it's, it's, it's more short-term powerful than I would say than an alcohol addiction. They'll say anything, and the, the 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 words are just tools used to get towards the goal. And if they happen to be deceptive, whatever, it doesn't matter. They're just practical tools to get towards the goal. And then when you get towards the goal and you take a nice shot of meth or something like that. You reinforce all those rationales that you use to get the drug, and then the next time you're even a better deceiver and liar. So, okay, so we're going to say motivations, one way of thinking about it is they set goals, but it's not the right way of thinking about it. They produce a whole framework of interpretation. And so we're going to think about that framework of interpretation. And then emotions emerge inside of that. So that's it. So the world is framed, motivation set goals. You could say the world has to be framed. So motivation sets that frame. Whose goals, emotions, perceptions, and actions. And then actions track progress. So positive emotion says you're moving forward properly towards your goal. And if you encounter something you don't expect, you stop. That's anxiety. It's like, oh, we're not where we thought we were. And so we don't know what to do. So we should stop because we don't know where we are or what we're doing. Stop, frozen. And then 
the more powerful negative emotions like pain, they might make you get out of there. So, emotions forward, stop, reverse. That's your emotions within that motivated frame. So, and that's another example of how your mind is embedded in your body. You know, emotions are like they're, they're offshoots of action tendencies. That's, that's the right way to think about it. Because action is everything, fundamentally. So, what are some basic motivations? Uh, most of these are regulated by the hypothalamus, by the way, and that, that tells you just how important a control system it is. The other thing that's useful to know about the hypothalamus is that it has projections going up from it that are like tree trunks and inhibitory projections coming down that are like grape vines. So you can kind of control your hypothalamus as long as it's not on too much, but if it's on in any serious way, it's like it, it wins. So partly what you do to stop yourself from falling under the dominion of your hypothalamus is to never ever be anywhere where its action is necessary right? you don't want to go into a biker bar because you might find yourself in a situation where panicked defensive aggression is immediately necessary you probably don't want that you don't want the panic, you don't want the terror you don't want the frenzied fight, you don't want any of that you don't want to have to run away in absolute panic so you just don't go there and, and a huge a huge part of how we regulate our emotions is just by never going anywhere where we have to experience them and so that has very little to do with internal inhibitory control and everything to do with staying where you belong so okay so basic motivations hunger thirst pain pain is not regulated by the hypothalamus that's a different circuit anger slash aggression thermal regulation panic and escape affiliation and care, sexual desire, exploration, play and you can kind of break those in you can kind of break those into uh, the classic Darwinian categories too and say well there's a set of motivations that go along with self maintenance that would be your survival ingestive and defensive see I've sort of coded them there so the, the self maintenance there's an ingestive set of basic motivations that go with self-maintenance you say that's hunger, thirst there's a set of defensive motivations pain, anger, thermal regulation, panic and escape and then there's, there's motivations that are associated with reproduction affiliation, care and sexual desire and then I put exploration and play sort of outside of that uh, I would say because those two things serve both of these approximately equally when I went to Harvard I came from McGill and I had spent a lot of time with my advisor there and, and a research team that he had trying to understand the genesis of antisocial behavior and it, among adolescents mostly so well as kids as well it's, antisocial behavior is very persistent so if you have a child who's conduct disordered at the age of four the probability that they will be criminal at the age of 15 or 20 is extremely high it's unbelievably stable it's a very dismal literature because you see these early onset aggressive kids and, and it's persistent and then you look at the intervention literature and you throw up your hands because no interventions work and believe me psychologists have tried everything you could possibly imagine and a bunch of things that you can't in order to ameliorate that so we were really interested in trying to understand, for example, if you're antisocial by the age of four, then there isn't an intervention that seems to be effective. So, and the, the, the standard penological theory is really quite horrifying in this regard, because what you see is that male aggression peaks around the age of 15, and then it declines fairly precipitously, and, and, and sort of normalizes again by the age of 27, and standard penological theory essentially is this cold-hearted, it's like if you, have a multi, if you have someone who's a multiple offender, you just throw them in prison until they're 27 then they age out of it and that's all there is to it, that's, that's what we've got now there's some downside to that because there's a corollary literature that suggests that the worst thing that you can do with antisocial people is to group them together which is what we do in prisons, so, so that's a whole mess anyways, one of the things we were doing was trying to see if there might be cognitive predictors of antisocial behavior and so we used this battery of neuropsychological tests that was put together at the Montreal Neurological Institute it took about 11 hours to administer and hypothetically assessed prefrontal cortical function we computerized that and reduced it to about 90 minutes and then um, assessed 
antisocial adolescents in, in Montreal and found out that they did show deficits in, in <coughs> problem solving ability that we uh, associated with, uh, with prefrontal ability. Um, when I got to Harvard I thought, well that's interesting. We could use the neuropsych battery to predict negative behavior. Perhaps we could use it to predict positive behavior. So I thought, well what if we turned the neuropsych battery and over and thought, well, can we predict grades, for example? Because you know that's a decent thing to predict. So, we ran a study. We ran a study that looked at Harvard kids, University of Toronto kids, line workers at a Milwaukee factory, and managers and executives at the same factory. And what we found was that the average score across these neuropsychological tests they were kind of like games. They were game-like, you know. So, in one in one test, you had, there were five lights in the middle of the screen and a box was associated with each light and you had to learn by trial and error which box was associated with, with each light, that was one of the tests. Uh, um, so, we took people's average score across the tests because they seemed to clump together into a single structure. You can, do, you can find that out statistically, if you take a bunch of tests you can find out how they clump together statistically by looking at their patterns of correlations and you might get multiple clumps, which is what happens with personality research where you get five or you might get a singular clump, which is what happens in cognitive research and we got a single clump, essentially and then we were trying to figure out if at the same time I was reading the literature on performance prediction and there's an extensive literature on performance prediction, a lot of it generated by the armed forces, by the way um, indicating that IQ is a very good predictor of long-term life success and so here's the, here's the general rule if your job is simple, which means you do the same thing every day then IQ predicts how fast you'll learn the job but not how well you, you do it but if your job is complex, which means that the demands change on an ongoing basis then the best predictor of success is general cognitive ability and, uh, and I learned that the general cognitive ability tests clump together into a single factor, that's fluid intelligence or, or IQ and then we didn't know if the factor that we had found was the same factor as IQ and, it, and we still haven't really figured out whether or not that was the case because it kind of depends on how you do the analysis but anyways, I, I got deeply into the performance prediction literature and I found out, well if you wanted to predict people's performance in life there's, there's a couple of things you need to know, you need to know their general cognitive ability if they're going to do a complex job you need to know their trait conscientiousness some of you might have heard that rebranded as grit in a very corrupt act, by the way um, because it's a good predictor of long-term life success freedom from negative emotion, low neuroticism is another predictor but it's sort of third on the hierarchy and then openness to experience, which is a personality trait, is associated with, with expertise in creative domains the evidence that, now I should tell you so this is such a complicated question, I should tell you how to make an IQ test because it's actually really easy and you need to know this to actually understand what IQ is so imagine that you generated a, a set of 10,000 questions okay, about anything they could be math problems, they could be general knowledge, they could be vocabulary, they could be multiple choice it really doesn't matter what they're about as long as they require abstraction to solve so they'd be formulated linguistically, but mathematically would also apply and then you have those 10,000 questions, now you take a random set of a hundred of those questions and you give them to a thousand people and all you do is sum up the answers, right? From, so some people are going to get most of them right and some, some of them are going to get most of them wrong you just rank order the people in terms of their score correct that for age and you have IQ that's all there is to it and what you'll find is that no matter which random set of a hundred questions you take the people at the top of one random set will be at the top of all the others and, and, and with very, very, very high consistency so one thing you need to know is that if any social science claims whatsoever are correct then the IQ claims are correct because the IQ claims are more psychometrically rigorous than any other phenomena, phenomenon that's been discovered by social scientists now the IQ literature is a dismal literature, no one likes it Here's why, here's an example So here's a little, here's a fun little fact for you For liberals and conservatives alike Because conservatives think there's a job for everyone If people just get off their asses and get to work And liberals think, well you can train anyone to do anything It's like, no, there isn't a job for everyone And no, you can't train everyone to do everything That's wrong And here's one of the consequences of that 
So, as I mentioned, the Armed Forces has done a lot of work on IQ and they started back in 1919 and the reason they did that was because, well, for obvious reasons, eh? let's say there's a war and you want to get qualified people into the officer positions as rapidly as possible or you'll lose so that's a reason now the armed forces has experimented with IQ tests since 1919 and in the last 20 years um, a law was passed as a consequence of that analysis which was that it was illegal to induct anyone into the armed forces who had an IQ of less than 83 now the question is why and the answer was all of that effort put in by the armed forces indicated that if you had an IQ of 83 or less there wasn't anything that you could be trained to do in the military that wasn't positively counterproductive now you got to think about that, eh? because the military is chronically desperate for people right, then it's not like they're it's not like people are lining up to be inducted right, they have to go out and recruit and it's not easy and so they're desperate to get their hands on every body they can possibly manage and then especially in wartime, but also in peacetime, but then there was another reason too, which was the armed forces was also set up from a policy perspective to take people in the underclass, let's say, and train them and move them up at least into the working class or maybe the middle class, so there's a policy element to it too and so even from that perspective you could see that the military is desperate to bring people in but you know, with an IQ of 83 or less it's not happening okay, so how many people have an IQ of 83 or less? 10% now, if that doesn't if that doesn't hurt you to hear then you didn't hear it properly because what it implies is that in a complex society like ours and one that's becoming increasingly complex there isn't anything for 10% of the population to do alright, well what are we going to do? are we going to ignore that? are we going to run away from that? and uh, well, believe me, we have every reason to or are we going to contend with the fact that we need to figure out how it is, how it is, how it might be possible to find a place for people on the lower end of the general cognitive distribution to take their productive and, and worthwhile place in society and that isn't just going to be a matter of dumping money down the hierarchy because giving people who have nothing to do money isn't helpful it doesn't work, it's not that simple Well. So that's kind of an answer to the question of whether or not we should deal with, the, with IQ forthrightly It's like, if you can find a flaw in that logic, like just go right ahead It's not like I was thrilled to death to discover all of this By no, by no stretch of the imagination was that the case so, so what? So IQ is reliable and valid That's the first thing It's more reliable and valid than any other psychometric test ever designed by social scientists by a factor of about three that's fact number one fact number two is it predicts long term life outcome at about 0 0.3, 0 0.4 which leaves about 85 percent, 70 to 85 percent of the story unexplained but it's still the best thing that we have well it's also the case that in places like Great Britain when IQ tests were first introduced they were actually used by the socialists and they were used to identify poor people who had potential, cognitive potential, and to move them into higher into institutes of higher education. So there's an upside, you know, a social upside as well. This is something you can't say anything about without without immediately being killed. So I'm hesitant to broach the topic. But I'll tell you one thing that I did in the last week that's relevant to this. So the and this just shows you how complex the problem is first of all we should point out that race is a very difficult thing to define because racial boundaries aren't tight right? so, and so when you talk about racial differences in IQ you, you're faced with the thorny problem of defining race and that's a big problem from a scientific perspective but we'll leave that aside and I wrote an article this week somebody stood up at one point in one of my talks and vice bless their hearts took this particular question and used it as an indication of the quality of the people who are my so-called followers and by the way, the quality of my so-called followers is pretty damn high and you can find that out quite rapidly just by going looking at the YouTube comments which are head and shoulders above the standard set of YouTube comments, I can tell you that <laughs> so someone asked me about the Jewish question, right? and the, the implication, it was actually someone Jewish, and the implication was that 
Um, Jews are overrepresented in positions of authority and power. And, and I was, had just spoken for like an hour and a half, and you know, this guy had an axe to grind, and I thought, there's no goddamn way I'm getting into this at the moment. And so I, I, said, I'm, I said, I can't answer that question. But that's not a very good answer. So I wrote a blog post this week, and I said, look, here's the, here's the situation. All right. Jews are overrepresented in positions of power and authority. But then, let's open our eyes a little bit, eh? And think for like two or three seconds and think, hey, guess what? They're also overrepresented in positions of competence. And it's not like we have more geniuses than we know what to do with. And if the Jews happen to be producing more of them, which they are, by the way, then that's a pretty good thing for the rest of us. So let's not confuse competence with power and authority, even though that's a favorite trick of the radical leftists, who always fail to make that distinction. Well, why does this overrepresentation occur? Because it does. It also, there's also overrepresentation in political movements, including radical political movements. Okay, why? Well, answer one, Jewish conspiracy. Okay, that's not a very good answer. We've had, we've used that answer before. All right, but, but do we have an alternative? Well, here's an alternative. The average Ashkenazi IQ is somewhere between 110 and 115, which is about one standard deviation above the population average. And so what that means is that the average Ashkenazi slash European Jew has an IQ that's higher than 85% of the population. That's a lot higher. Now, that doesn't make that much difference in the middle of the distribution, okay? But geniuses don't exist at the middle of the distribution. They exist at the tails of the distribution. And you don't need much of a move at the mean to produce walloping differences at the tails. And the tails are important because a lot of where we draw, we draw exceptional people from the exceptions. Right? So here's, an exa here's another example of the same thing. Most engineers are male. Why? Because men are more interested in things and women are more interested in people. And you might say, well, that's sociocultural. It's like, no, it's not. And we know that because if you stack up countries by their, by their egalitarian social policies, which you can do quite effectively, and then you look at the overrepresentation of men in STEM fields, the overrepresentation increases as the countries become more egalitarian. So it's not sociocultural. Okay, now, men aren't that much more interested in things than women. It's one standard deviation, which is about the same difference, by the way, between the population norm and the Ashkenazi Jews. But if you're looking at the person, the one person in 20, or the one person in 50, who's most, who's hyper interested in things, and thus likely to become an engineer, then most of them are men. Here's another example of the same thing. Men are more aggressive than women. Now, you might ask, how much? And the answer to that is, best place to look at that is in Sweden, where the egalitarian policies have been laid out for a long period of time, and you can, you can get a more direct inference about biology. If you took a random man and a random woman out of the population, and you had to bet on who was more aggressive, and you bet on the man, you'd be right 60% of the time. So that's not that much, right? It it's deviates from 50-50, but it's not like 90-10, it's 60-40. Okay, so, so what does that mean? Well, we got a tail problem here again. Let's say that now you decide to go out onto the extremes of aggression and you identify the most aggressive one in a hundred persons. They're all men. Guess who's in prison? Those people. That's why most of the people in prison are men. And so this is elementary. Part of the problem in our society is that we don't understand statistics. We don't understand that you can have relatively small differences at the population level that produce walloping consequences at the tails of the distribution. Okay, so back to IQ. One final thing to say about IQ. The ethnic differences are difficult to dispense with. It's not easy to make them go away. You can say, well, the tests aren't culture fair. Well, here's a test of that. So imagine you, you test group A with an IQ test, and you test group B with an IQ test, and then you look at their actual performance in whatever you're predicting. If the test was biased against ethnic group A, then it would under-predict their performance. 
and that doesn't happen now you could say, well there's systemic bias in the performance measures and the potential measures and that's a possibility All right. now, one other thing about that there's a real danger in the ethnicity IQ debate and the, the danger is that we confuse intelligence with value or that we include, we, we confuse intelligence with, yeah, with human value that's a better way of thinking about it and one of the things that we're going to have to understand here is that that's a mistake is that being more intelligent doesn't make you a better person that's not the case, it makes you more useful for complex cognitive operations but you can be pretty damn horrific as a genius son of a bitch right, it's morally neutral, and we also know that from the psychometric data by the way there doesn't seem to be any relationship whatsoever between intelligence and virtue and so, if it does turn out that nature and the fates do not align with our egalitarian presuppositions, which is highly probable we shouldn't therefore make the mistake of assuming that if group A or person A is lower on one of these attributes than group B or person B that that is somehow reflective of their intrinsic value as human beings that's a big mistake 